Today's shir begins almost halfway down the page, 17 lines from the top. Before we begin the Gemara, we glance at the side under our no say our topic heading, where we've written Ho'imer Shtar Amona Huze Eno Nemon. Someone who says that this star is a star Amona, so he is not believed. Let us take a look at Rashi before we learn the Gemara text itself. Rashi you'll find a bit more than halfway down. Star Amona, Lo Lovaklum. A uh, person didn't actually borrow any money. He wrote it up and gave it to the Malve, the uh, lender. If the borrower should need money, he'll borrow. And the borrower, the potential borrower, trusted the potential lender, that he wouldn't use this document to collect unless an actual loan was extended. So Amona, as Rashi says, you can see he, he uh, used the word vehemino, omein, emuna. This has to do with belief I tr- or trust. I trusted the, uh, l- the potential lender not to attempt to collect with this document unless an actual loan was extended. So you have a, a loan document prepared uh, ahead of time for possible use. So one who claims that a... Well, now let's go to the Gemara text. Omer of Yuna Marav. Ha'oimer shtar amona huze. One who claims that this is a shtar amona, meaning it's a document that uh, does not represent an actual loan that had been extended. And hence it cannot be used as a uh, an instrument of collection. Eino ne'amon. Anyone who claims that about a document is not believed. The Gemara asks, you'll notice we have several lines, and we have numbering one through three, and on the side of the Gemara, under the Mivne heading, you can see a squiggle underline one through three. These are Nisyonos, Levar, Mihu, Ze, Sheno, Nemon. We're going to attempt to understand who is it that is not believed. The Gemara, it's a long question. The Komar Man, who is it that said this is a Shtar Amona that we said is not believed? The borrower claims that it's not a real document of loan. Pshita, Kol Kamine. Pshita means it's obvious that he's not believed. Would he have the power to, um, to say otherwise? Would he have the power to say that the. That the uh, that the document is not an actual document. Of course he doesn't have the power to say that. The document indicates that this fellow borrowed money. You're not going to believe the, the fellow to say, oh, I didn't really borrow the money. The lender says, uh, this uh, document is not an actual uh, document. and I, I never actually extended a loan. So this fellow uh, doesn't have to pay up. He doesn't, he's not expected, I'm not going to, I'm not going to collect with it. Well, Tavo Olov Broka, why do you say that he's not believed? Let a, let he be blessed. Tavo Olov, let there come upon him a Broka. Let him be blessed for his honesty. Elo, the Koamri Edim. Witnesses. Uh, the witnesses that uh, signed the document. They say that we signed this document, but it's not uh, because an actual loan had been extended. And uh, Rav Yudam Rav says they would not be believed. Well, if their signatures could be verified from an external source, it's obvious that we would not believe them. Because as far as we're concerned, we have uh, verifiable signatures on a document that indicates a loan had been extended. The e the ain ksav yodom yoytsi mimokam acher, and if there is no external evidence of of these signatures being those of these witnesses, and their statement that uh, yes we signed this document but a loan never took place, am I lo mehemli? Why would you not believe them? They are the source of the signature verification, and they are also 
therefore believed to tell us that the loan never took place. The Gemara, as it goes on, is characterized by some new markings. And on the side, we have a trapezoid or volcano shape. These represent Gimel Deos, Almi Huzeh She'eno Nemon. Who is it, in fact, that's not believed? The Oim Roy, when he declares Shtar Amona Huzeh, that this was a Shtar Amona, not an actual loan document. Three opinions, Love, Malve, and Aden. The three that we just went through are going to be presented here as the one that is not believed. Omar Rova, Li Oilom de Gomar Loive. The borrower said that a loan had not taken place. And he is the one that we're not believing. Now, you'll ask, well, is that not obvious? So, in order to uh, explain why it's necessary to teach that the borrower is not believed and is not so obvious, the Ravuna, based on Ravuna's teaching. Diyom Ravuna Marav, Moide Bishtar Shekosvoy, a borrower that admits that he prepared this star indicating his taking out a loan. Ein Tzorach Lekaimo, the Malve does not have to verify the signatures in the loan. That once the Lova admits, I wrote it, he is not believed to say anymore, he's not believed to say that it's a mere star Amona. And what Rava is telling us, and this you can only see in Rashi, Kedaravuna, the Ashmeinen Rav Yehuda Nami Hochi. Uh, not only does Rav Huna say that, but Rava is telling us that Rav Yehuda also says thusly. The Loiva Shomar Kosaftiv Umasartiv Lo, a borrower that says, I wrote this document and I gave it to the Malva, to the lender. Avoshtar Amonahu, ain't Sorah Hamava Lachs Ulohavi Ulohaid Al Hachasima. The Malva doesn't have to go any further to. Uh, verify the signatures. The Ain Nemon Loiva Leposlo. The Lova is not believed to disqualify the document. The Lo Ovid Inish, the Kosa Vumosa, Blow Avo. It's not normal, it's not common for people to write a document indicating a loan had been extended when it never actually was. So the point of Rava is to tell me that not only does Rav Huna say in the name of Rav that Rav Yehuda also says in the name of Rav that a Lova that concedes he wrote the document that's it as far as the Malva is concerned it's considered a verified document and he can use it to collect with it and the Lova is not believed to say that it's a Shtar Amona. Abaye Omar. We continue with number two, with the Bays, the Oilom, the Omar, Malve. The Malve is the one that said this is not a real document of loan. And you'll ask them, why is he not believed? Did we not say before he should be blessed for his honesty that he will not be able to collect with it? So the Gemara points out that the reason he is not believed is ukegoin shechov laachirim by his uh, say statement that the star is a star amona and that he cannot collect with it. This has uh, bad tidings or an ill effect on a third party. Chov l'acherim. It causes a loss to a third party. As a result of the malve not being able to collect with this because of his, we'll say, his confession or his admittance that this loan, his admission that this loan is uh, was never extended. So that the sum of money that was represented by that document is now a sum of money that the Malva is not going to access. He's not going to possess. How does this affect others? Uchir Rabbi Nosan. 
based on Rabbi Nosson's teaching, this is a very well known halacha called Shibuda de Rabbi Nosson, de Sanya, Rabbi Nosson Oimer, Minayim Lenoishe Bechaver Omona. From where do we know that if uh, A is trying to collect from B? Bechavero, Bechavero. And B is trying to collect from C. From where do we know that A, who was trying to collect money from B, and B was trying to collect money from C, that A is allowed to collect directly from C? Talmud Lomar, Vinosan Lasher, Oshem Lo. From that posuk, and uh, Rashi gives a little more explanation to that, but for our purposes, from this posuk, we see this principle. So now, as we said, A was trying to collect from B. And B was trying to collect from C. But if B says that C doesn't really owe him any money, so then A is not going to have a source of collection from the money that B had owed A. In other words, B's source of payment to Mr. A, A who was trying to collect money from B, that would be all fine and good if B had a source of of income, a source of funding. But if that source of his sole source of funding was C's supposed debt to B, and that never existed, so A is going to lose out. So for B to say that... A, that C doesn't really owe him any money, that is causing Mr. A to lose out. And therefore, in this case, the Malve, who was represented by Mr. B, and his claim that C never borrowed money from him, is causing a loss to Mr. A. Rav Ashi Omar, the Oilom de Kamri Edim. So after seeing Rova, who said, who said it was the Love that's not believed and Abaye that's saying it's the Malve that's not believed to say Shtar Amona Rav Ashi tells us it's the Edim the witnesses they are not believed Udain Ksav Yodom and it's a case where there is no other independent source of signature verification. And you'll ask them, well, why are they not believed? If they are the ones that are verifying the signature, so in effect, they're the ones that are making the star into a star. So why should they not be believed for the rest of the story, indicating that the loan never took place? The answer to that is Kedorav Kahana. The reason they're not believed is based on Rav Kahana's teaching. The Yom Rav Kahana, and you'll notice we have a house marking on the side. The Mivne um, heading indicates Litzor Kesher Bein Rav Kahana for Rav Shub and Levi Bomid Beis. We want to create a connection between Rav, what, what Rav Kahana says here and Rav Shub and Levi on the fourth line from the top of Bomid Beis. The double underline are is a, another series marking and we've written on the side Dvarim Shasurim uh, Lishoisam uh, different types of uh, writings things that are written out that one is not allowed to to maintain in his possession Mishum Shinema Al Tashken Boelecho Avla do not keep within your midst within your home that which is a uh, sinful what do we mean by that? That which represents wrongfulness. The three examples that we'll see, Shtar Amona, that's uh, what Rav Kana tells us. Shtar Amona, we've already discussed, it's a document indicating a loan was taken when it never really was extended. Uh, Shtar Perua, that's a, a document that indicated a loan had taken place and was actually paid up. A Shtar Perua, a paid up loan document ought to be torn up by leaving it extant you're endangering the love to be collected from a second time so we don't want uh, it's not proper to leave a star perua around number three 
Sefer Shina Muga Me'al Shloishim Yom, and that's what Rav Ami tells us. That's a holy scroll, like a Sefer Torah, Nevi'im, Ksuvim, that have not been checked for error, haven't been proofread. That's a Sefer Shina Muga that you leave as is for more than 30 days. All of these uh, are examples of Al Tashke Boyolecha Avlo, according to each one of these opinions, respectively. The question will come up does each one hold from what the other one says? So that we'll have to see in the Gemara. In the meantime, Adim that tell us that this is a star, that what we signed is a, we signed a star Amona, they are not believed. The, uh, Ultimately, the problem here is is that by their claiming that they signed a Shtar Amona, they're basically saying that we did something wrong. They're testifying about themselves as having committed a sinful act, an act of rishus, of evil. And uh, a person is not believed when he testifies about himself uh, that uh, a testimony that would change his status from an, from a a, a pious individual from a proper individual to a wicked individual. A person, an outsider can testify to that effect, but a person cannot testify about himself because a person is considered related to himself. He's a relative. Relatives cannot testify one for the other and and, and, and uh, all the more so, one cannot testify about himself. He is related to himself. So we go back to the Gemara. We said that the Adim, who in effect are verifying their signatures, are nevertheless not believed to say that what they signed was a Shtar Amona. It is forbidden for a person to keep in his house such a document. The Pesach says, do not. Uh, uh, and able to dwell in your midst a, a, an avla something that is a uh, of a sinful, wrongful nature the Omar Rav Sheshis we're continuing at the top of Omid Beis the Omar Rav Sheshis braid Rav Iti Shema Mino Amid Rav Kahana Rav Sheshis says in the name uh, that is Rav uh, Sheshis says we conclude from Rav Kahana's statement that from, from uh, that which Rav Kahana refers to the Shtar Amona as an avla as a sinful act, sinful document. Edim Shamru, Amona Hayud Vorenu, witnesses that say we signed a Shtar Amona, in effect, they're saying we enabled the sinful act to take place. Edim on it, they're not believed. They're not believed to tell us that it's a Shtar Amona. Rather, it'll be, in our eyes, a regular loan document with which the a uh, lender would be able to collect. My time, why are they not believed? Kevon de Avlo, who, since a Shtar Amona is something forbidden, a Avlo lo Hasmi. People are not allowed to sign a Shtar Amona. And therefore, they're not believed to say that they did something wrong. They are not believed to say about themselves that they did a sinful act. This, of course, is based on the principle that we mentioned before that a person is not neemon lahar shio esatzmo to make himself into a rasha. Omar Rav Yeshua ben Levi also lo leodam shiashish tar purua besoch beso. A person is not allowed to keep in his house a paid-up document, a paid-up loan document. Mishum shenema al tashkein boalecho avlo, as the pasuk says. One is not allowed to keep in his house that which is sinful. In Eretz Yisrael, it was said in the name of Rav. If there is a sin, uh, or if there is evil in your midst, distance it. According to this drush up, the Shtar Amona, as well as the Shtar Pasim, is uh, under the heading of a of an oven biadcha. We uh, should say a word about a Shtar Pasim. 
This has to do with a, uh, an attempt to uh, create a deal to uh, motivate someone to, uh, to let's say, uh, transfer something, to sell something, but he hasn't yet done it. According to the note on the side of the Gemara, Shepaiso Lahalvois Loi Shtar. Someone uh, entices someone or, or uh, influences someone, convinces someone to allow them to borrow a star. You can have a situation where, for whatever reason, a person wants to make an impression that he has, that he has funds available, when in fact he doesn't have funds available. So what does he do? This person wants to... Uh, you can often have a case like this where someone wants investors to invest with him, so he wants to show that he's a man of means. So what does he do? He, he convinces someone that loaned money to others to en- enable this fellow to borrow that document. To borrow the star, the bill of credit, or the loan document. This is something that one is not allowed to do. And hence, uh, the Pesach says, Im so, so far, but we want to really focus us on the Shtar Amona. Uh, uh, this drosha says that the Shtar Amona is something not to have in your midst. The Pesach, what we saw before, the Altash Kein Boelach Avla, Ze Shtar Porua. That is, that Pesach refers to a loan that has already been paid up. Don't keep those paid up loan documents in your possession. Man de Omar Shtar Porua, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, who said that a Shtar Porua is forbidden. A Shtar Porua, bear in mind, is a Shtar, it's a, it represents a loan that had actually been extended. It's not something that's fictitious. So, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, who says that a Shtar Porua is forbidden to keep around, Kol Shekein Shtar Amona. All the more so a shtar amona, which is essentially something fictitious. Uman de Omar shtar amona. Rav Kahana, uh, at the bottom of Omer Aleph, who said that shtar amona is forbidden. Avol shtar perua lo, but to state uh, unequivocally that a shtar perua, a paid up loan document, is forbidden to keep around, that he would not say. So you'll have to ask, well, what's the legitimacy of keeping a paid-up loan document around? The zimnin, the mashile, apshiti, the safra. Sometimes people will keep those uh, paid-up loan documents because of pshiti, the safra. The easiest thing for us to do is to look at Rashi, the second line from the top. Apshiti, the safra, sha'al, haloivaliten schara sofer. In terms of procedure... It is the borrower who is expected to pay the scribe who prepares these documents the scribe's fee. Upamim she'ein loy. Sometimes the borrower is really short of cash. He doesn't even have the money to pay the scribe. The nois noi hamalve. The lender actually pays the scribe. He lays out scribe money as well. In addition to the the basic loan uh, that he also lays out the scribe money and the hope is that the lender will collect in addition to the loan he'll collect the scribe money as well at the time of payout and the lender will say that listen until you pay me the scribe money as well I'm not tearing up I'm not giving you back the loan document to tear up. So, of course, that will motivate the borrower to pay the scribe money as well. He doesn't want to feel endangered that uh, he could be collected from again. We uh, continue in the Gemara after having pointed out that uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, who would not allow a star paru to be kept around, even though there was a you could see legitimate circumstances for that to be kept around, all the more so he would not allow the Shtar Amona. There's no legitimate reason for that. However, Rav Kahana, who said that the Shtar Amona is prohibited, but the Shtar Parua, we explained, there's legitimate reason for keeping it around, even though it's a 
loan document where the basic loan has already been paid up. And as we said, the basic loan may have been paid up, but the scribe money was not. Itmar, Sefer She'en Muga, a an unchecked holy scroll. It hasn't been checked uh, from, uh, uh, as Rashi says, Muga Min Toyo Shabo. It could be that we're talking not so much as we implied before, it was simply a text that hasn't been checked yet, but it's a text that had mistakes in it that were not corrected. So, to be more accurate than we said, than we indicated earlier, a Sefer Shinomuga would be an, a uh, text with mistakes that have not been corrected. Omar Abiyami, so up till 30 days you can keep it around. More than 30 days you can't keep it in that state. You have to make sure it's repaired. And the source for this is don't allow to uh, dwell in your midst that which is wrongful. In this case, a holy scroll that has mistakes in it is something wrong. As we go on in the Gemara, we encounter a new topic heading. The slash mark indicates that that which follows is a new trend of thought. On the side of the Gemara, under the Nosei, we've written, Eidim Hameidim Shechosmu Al Hashtar. Witnesses that testify, yes, we signed this document, Avon Mosifim. But they add, Amono Hoyud Varenu. The document represents a loan that was never extended. It was an Ashtar Amona, as we said, or the witnesses say, We signed a document, but the, let's say, the subject of the document had indicated ahead of time that he was uh, under duress and he didn't want this to be done. That's a Moidah. Moidah is a, we'll say, a uh, declaration or a disclaimer that is made before the document was signed. And number three, Tanai Hoyu Dvorenu. Tanai is a uh, condition or stipulation was, uh, was made. Our witnesses then believed when, after verifying the document, whose text is pretty much black and white, you don't have any doubts about the text itself, the text is clear indicating that a, uh, a loan uh, had been made or uh, a, a sale had been made. The additional information is, is what is questionable regarding the witnesses. Can they tell us this additional information that would of course um, upset uh, um, disqualify the document as such? Omar Rav Nachman, we should point out actually under the Mivne heading, the diamond is used to have lotas, machlokas, Rav Nachman, Omar Baravashi. We want to highlight the controversy between Rav Nachman and Mar Baravashi, Binyan Moido Hayu Dvorenu. Their machlokas concerns that case where they sign a document but indicate that a disclaimer had been made beforehand. The Gemara. Omer of Nachmon. Edim Shomru. Amona Hoyu Dvorenu. Ein Nemonim. And the uh, Rashi explains that uh, something that is uh, oral, something that's Alpe, cannot come along and undo that which is written. So when they say, they say orally that the, the loan never was extended when the document itself indicates that the loan had been extended the oral declaration cannot undo that which the, uh, uh, the obvious writing indicates and the obvious writing indicates that uh, a loan had been extended likewise uh, number two if witnesses say that the seller uh, issued a disclaimer before the actual sale saying that 
this is under duress, it's against my will. And they went ahead and uh, signed a document indicating that a sale was made. So witnesses who tell us that, ain nemonim, they're not believed. Mor bravash yomar, he goes over these two points, however, there's a disagreement regarding point two. Number one, amono hoyu dvorenu ain nemonim, modo hoyu dvorenu nemonim. Witnesses who say that the seller who's indicated in this document is having sold some particular item, that seller told us that he was forced to do so, he was under duress. And if they tell us that, uh, they are believed. And hence the sale is voided. My time off. Why the distinction? Hai nitan likosev, va hai lo nitan likosev. The modo uh, is something, a, a, a document that indicates a transaction. But there were a, uh, um, forced circumstances. That kind of document can be written. The preparation of that document with its signing saves the person under duress from injury, from harm. So in order to save someone from harm, you are allowed to write up a document indicating that the sale had taken place when in fact it was all under duress. So to save someone from oiness, that is allowed to be done. The high, the star amona, lo nitan li kosev. To have a, a document indicating a loan uh, had taken place when it never did, that is not something that one is allowed to prepare. A, uh, such a document. Can't, they're not supposed to sign such a document. And when they say that they did so, they're making themselves into Rishoyim. And as we said before, a person is not believed to make himself into a Russia. Hence, a Shtar Amona is not allowed to be prepared. That's why they're not believed when they say that this was a that we signed a Shtar Amona. Bo mine Rava me Rav Nachman. The question you can see lasts several lines. It's an Aleph Oy Dilma base. Two sides of the question are presented. Rava asked of Rav Nachman, Tanai Hayud Vorenu Mahu. Witnesses that say these are our signatures, but the sale that's reflected in this document was a sale done under with, uh, or uh, with stipulations. And the witnesses are telling us that the whole sale was made conditionally, and we did not see the conditions fulfilled. The witnesses say they didn't see the conditions fulfilled, and the uh, the uh, seller said the conditions were never fulfilled, and therefore it's no sale. So witnesses who tell us this, Tanai Hoyu Dvorenu Mahu, are they believed? Bear in mind that the question is directed to Rav Nachman. Now Rav Nachman equated the Shtar Amona and the Shtar and the Moida as both being prohibited. So with that in mind, Moida Amona, both of those Hainu Taimo. The reason Rav Nachman said they're not believed. The Koakri lay the Shtara by saying that the loan was never extended, they're undoing, they're uprooting the star. By saying that the sale was under duress, they're uprooting the sale. They're akri, akri means to uproot. Akri le lishtara. And we have a rule that that which is oral, that which is alpeh, cannot undo that which is written. That the loa si alpeh umeira le lishtar. Vehai nami, the statement of the witnesses that the sale was conditional, Ka'okra uh, lishtara. That leads to the uprooting of the document and the deal that is contained therein. Oidilma, or possibly there's another way of looking at the uh, uh, testimony of it being a Tanai. Tanai milso achritihi. It could be that their statement that the sale was made conditionally is not uprooting the entire deal they're they're conceding that it was a legitimate sale 
just that there was also a condition to it. And that might be viewed as a separate type of testimony. Uh, if we look at Rashi together, O Dilma, Rashi that we're looking at just a couple lines up from here, O Dilma, Holo Akrasa Dishtarahu, their statement that the sale was conditional is not an uprooting of the sale. The Moidimheim Shashtar Emes, they concede that the document is truthful as it is. And they're adding, El Shatanai Hoya Benehem, there was a condition between the seller and the purchaser. This is a separate piece of testimony. It's not a direct confrontation with the uh, veracity of the document as was the case with calling it a shtar amona or saying that the, that the sale was, um, uh, was uh, under duress. Ushtara Rashi says, Ushtara Meila Ma'akila Harzman, Biyom Shalom Kiyem Tano, Bismano. As far as the shtar and its, and its uh, loss of of um, substance, loss, less loss of veracity, is only a function of the passage of time with the conditions not being met. But that's not an act, uh, the uprooting of the star is not something that the witnesses are themselves creating. So the question then is, to the question poster of Nachman, testimony of the witnesses that yes these are our signatures uh, and uh, you should just be aware that the sale that's reflected or represented by this document was conditional is that like the case of Moido and Amona or not Omar Lay we continue with the Gemara Rav Nachman says back Ki osu l'kamon l'dina when uh, purchasers come to us and the witnesses say that the Purchase was done uh, conditionally. Amrino Lahu, we in the court tell the purchasers, Zilu Kaimu Tanaihu, the Khosu Ladina. Go and fulfill your conditions that were made to the owners. And, uh, and then, if there are any problems, so then come to court. But the first thing you've got to do is to fulfill the conditions. You, think, you see here that Rav Nachman is granting believability uh, to the uh, witnesses and their testimony that the sale was done conditionally. And hence, it's not like the case of Amona or Moida. Before we continue in the Gemara, we uh, glance at the side where we have a, no say, a topic heading. Uh, in which we've uh, written Shnei Eidim Shemeidim Achasimosam Two witnesses that testify, that verify their signatures Ve'echad mehem oimer shohoyo hashtar al t'nayin One of the witnesses says that the the uh, deal, the document uh, and uh, that which is contained therein was done on condition Nigamora Eid omer t'nayin Ve'eid omer eno t'nayin one witness says that uh, again we spoke about these witnesses these are witnesses that are verifying their signatures verification of signatures establishes the veracity of the document well one of these witnesses also adds that the, the uh, sale contained therein was conditional and one witness says not so Omar of Papa Travayu Bishtor Maya Komisiti Papa says the two witnesses they he doesn't view them as simply as contradictory witnesses, but rather there's a common denominator that is, they both agree that the document was a truthful document, that a sale had taken place. Vahai de Komar Tanai, the one witness. In Jewish law, of course, we need two witnesses uh, in general to establish facts. So you have one witness that said it was a sale made on condition. Havile Chad. He is a singular witness. We aimed Vorov Shalechod Bemokam Shnayim. A singular witness to add this information that is Tanai has no strength in the face of two. Now, the two in this case means that he and the other witness that are conceding that the document was a formal, uh, uh, truthful document. Maskif law Rav Huna Vreid Rav 
Ihachi Afilu Trevayu Nami. If you're going to say that we're not going to believe uh, the one witness that says it was conditional, that should be the same if the two witnesses say that it was conditional. And Rashi explains, we look together at Rashi, across from here, a line or two down, Yach Afilu Trevayu Nami, Elo Amrina Vuchulei Ihachi, the Kevon Sheheyed Al Ksav Yodoi Osisa Lozeh Echod below tonight. Since you are saying that the um, one witness who told us it was conditional, you're actually telling us that he was one of the verifying witnesses. And as such, he, together with the other witness, were saying that the star is good as it is, without a condition. And that, and you have two witnesses saying thus, thusly, the Eid of Sachrona, the the second piece of testimony that the one witness gave, divrei echad b'mokam shnayim, it's considered like one witness versus two. The uh, irony here is when we speak about two, one of those two is, is this guy himself, because his initial testimony was saying that the star is is good as it is by his simple verification of the signature. So you have himself and the other witness saying that it's a 100% kosher star as it is. And the second piece of testimony that this that one of them gives us that it was conditional is of no strength because it's it's a singular testimony versus two. Well, if that's how you're going to analyze things, Rashi goes on, Afilu Trayu Nami Amri Tanayu Yudvoyrinu Even if both witnesses say that the star was conditional, let us not believe them. The Kevon Shidu Aksav Yodon, once they testify about the signatures as being theirs, Kaimu Ashtar, that verifies the Shah Kamoshu, as it is. Kamoshu Kosov, as it is. The Chi Amri Tanai Hoyud Vorenu, and when they add that additional information <coughs> that it was conditional, Havu Lahu Megidim Bechayzim Megidim. This is a concept in testimony that once you testify, you can't you can't reverse the testimony. You can't change your testimony. We say kevon shehikid. Once you testify, you can't change your testimony. You can't alter it. Why would Rav Nachman have told the purchasers after witnesses saying that the purchase was made but with conditions? Why? Did Rav Nachman give any credibility to that information concerning the presence of a condition? <coughs> it should not have been listened to. Once the witnesses verified the document, that's it. The further information that uh, that was uh, that was also conditional is not acceptable according to the laws of testimony. So why did Rav Nachman place any credence uh, on that that there had been a condition? So now we go back to the Gemara. Ela Amrinon Hani Lemaakis of the Sayakasi. Hainami Lemaakir Saduse Kaasi. Let's take now a look at Rashi. Rashi in the uh, last narrow line, Elo Al Korchoch Lav Hasimo Mekuyemes Hu. This whole story involving witnesses that say, yes, these are our signatures, but it was a star prepared conditionally. In other words, the deal represented the star, the sale was a sale with conditions. This is not considered a case of two separate statements, first being verification, and then a separate testimony concerning a condition. The Keva the Tokade Dibor Masi Dibravi Amri Aval Tanayo Benehim. Since within seconds, there's an expression, Tokade Dibor, means within two or three seconds they uh, added this information that after saying, yes, these are our signatures, but, and they continue within seconds, they continue uh, in the same breath, saying, uh, but the sale was conditional. 
Amrinon Hani Lumakis of the Sayu Shamruk Savio Denuhu Kosu. What they're in effect doing is they're uprooting that which they started by saying this these are our signatures. The Lomar and they say they're saying Lo Hasamnu Ela Amanashi Kaimas at night. Yes, these are our signatures, but we signed only on condition that the conditions of the of the deal would be met. The cave of the Tanai Milso Achritihi Sheena Okroso Eloliachazman and since the issue of a condition is an external idea, it doesn't uproot the document immediately. It's it would it will in effect uproot the, the deal but only in the with the passage of time. In this respect, it's not like the case of Moidoan Amona. And they're believed. The Edus Bifne It's a separate piece of testimony. For our purposes, it's not testimony that directly uproots the Shtar. So what you have here is the verification of the signatures indicating yes this is a kosher star and additional information that a condition must be met this is not a function of kivan shigit shuvei nechazur makid the reason for that is because it's all toch kedei or it's all said within the same breath it's not like a case of of amona and moida which are cases where they verify the signatures but they they immediately are uprooting the validity of the document. Not so here, when the information <coughs> they are telling us is that the document or the sale represented therein was conditional. Now Rashi continues, that having been said, we understand why Rav Nachman, upon hearing witnesses saying that the star is a good star, but there was a condition why he took that information seriously. What about a case where you have the two witnesses, <coughs> but one of them saying that the the document I signed was was prepared with a condition. So Rashi continues, Hi Nami, the case of the one witness adding that information, Kisim Omar Tanai Have. Yes, this is my signature, but there was a condition. Okar Luchasimas Yode. He is uprooting the verification of the signature. Lomar saying, Lo Chasamti Elo Amanas Kane. I signed that the sale is a sale, but only with this condition in mind. The Kevo de Islon de Milso Achritihi, Ustara Memelo Maaker. And since we hold that the condition is considered separate information, and the star gets undone, gets uprooted on its own. the ein b'shtar chosum elo eid echad. You have, as far as a star chosum, a signed document, a signed, say, unqualified signed document. You only have one witness to that effect, and therefore, a uh, a document with one witness signing it is not going to have any strength to it. So we go back to the Gemara. The Gemara now rules the Hilchasa, Karavhuna, Braid Rav Yeshua. And the Halacha will follow Rav Huna as opposed to Rav Papa. If you noted, just to review the point, according to Rav Papa, the uh, case where the two witnesses say, acknowledge their signatures, but one of them uh, told us that it was conditional, we simply disregard that information. According to Rav Huna Brev Yeshua, given those same circumstances, he says, in effect, you have only one witness signing what's a, what would be, we would call an unconditional star. Well, one witness doesn't carry any weight. And hence, according to Rav Huna, that star would be invalid. It wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to collect or maintain ownership with such a document. Before we continue in the Gemara, we glance at the side. We have a Nosei topic heading where we've written Edim, Haboyim, Minashuk, the witnesses that come from outside, Umi Edim, Achasimos, Shebeshtar, 
ומוסיפים שגם יודעים שהיו החויסמים קטנים, אנוסים וכו'. You have outside verification of, of uh, signatures. And these outsiders who are verifying the signatures add the information that the uh, signers were under duress or they were unqualified to sign. Let's see the source. Tona Rabbonan. Shnayim Hasumin al Hashtar Umesu. Two had signed a document, they died. Ubo Shnayim in Ashuk, and two others came from the public, come from the market, the Yomru. Yodanu Shiksav Yodam Hu. Yes, we recognize these signatures. Avol Anusim Hoyu, Ketanim Hoyu, Psuliedis Hoyu. Uh, yes, they signed it, but these were people signed under uh, circumstances of onus, of duress, or they were minors, or they were relatives, they were psulim, or they were gamblers, they were unfit to sign. Hare elu ne'emonim. They are believed. V'im yesh edim shiksav yodam huzeh. If, however, there are other witnesses that these are authentic signatures, or there were other documents that had these signatures in them, and those other documents had been verified. Uh, let's read that again and see this all in the words. Uh, uh, O shehoya ksav yodam yoytzim emokam achem mishtar shekor lov aror. The other, the, the these signatures were seen in other documents that had been subjected to a challenge. The huchsik bebeisdin. These external documents were challenged and withstood the challenge and were verified in court. Ein elu neemonim. The witnesses, the first fellows that told us. Yeah, we recognize these signatures, but they were unqualified. They were people that were uh, unqualified to sign, uh, or it was uh, circumstances of duress. You're saying that if those, if the signatures in this document could have been independently verified by other witnesses or by appearance in other documents. That these guys are not believed to say that the uh, that the signatory the signatures were those of of minors. Oh, so if they're not believed, that means uh, that's a it's a it's a it's a solid star. And the Gemara asks, Are you telling me then that we're gonna we're going to uh, disregard the information? Uh, rendering the signature, signatures uh, as unfit and then call it a perfectly good star and collect with it? Ramai, why would you entitle the the lender, let us say, holding this document to collect with it? Treu train in who we've got a situation of two versus two. You've got the people telling us that the signatories were minors, and then you've got the Independent verification of the signatures, which would indicate that they were not minors. Simple, simply that I simply stated that since I don't need these uh, these fellows, these witnesses, to verify the signatures because they can be independently verified. So I uh, I don't need their testimony about being minors. But at the end of the day, you've got a situation of two against two. Rashi at the bottom, Trey Trey Ninu, Ede Hashtar Shnayim. The two signatures that appear in the document represent two solid witness testi- pieces of testimony, two solid signatures. And you've got these other guys saying that they were disqualified at that time, at the time that they signed it. So when you have two against two, that would indicate that uh, you would throw everything out. How can you allow the? How can this source indicate that we don't listen? We we disregard the uh, first or the, the the testimony of their being minors and allow the the lender to collect with it. Don't we have a situation of contradictory testimony? Well, that's what's implied. Though we've got to explain. Then how can that be? 
On the side of the Gemara, we have a Mivneh, a structural note, where a triangle is featured. And we've indicated here that the, the, we're going to see a Machlokis, Rav Sheshis Rav Nachmon, Al Mayash Ba'osam Shel Edim Ho'elu. What's the effect? What influence does this testimony have? Namely, that the, uh, that the, that the signers have been uh, unqualified to sign at the time that they did. Omar Rav Sheshis, Zois Oimeris, from the fact that we don't seem to pay attention to the first, to the witnesses that appeared at the beginning of this source. Uh, in the case that we were able to verify the signatures independently, this shows us the following principle. Hakosha tchilas hazomahi. Hakosha is a term reserved for witness, testimony that is, is contradictory. Hazoma is a unique institution within the laws of, of testimony. Hazoma is not a direct contradiction in the testimony, but rather it's a situation where after two witnesses testify concerning a certain event, two others come along and say, how can you have testified about that event? You guys were with us at that time that you're you're claiming the event took place. We're not denying that the event took place, but what we're saying is that you could not possibly have testified about it. So we have two principles are two laws regarding testimony. One is referred to as hakosha, that's contradictory testimony, and the second is the law of hazoma, as we, just, as we explained. Rav Shesha says that from the fact that in the case of or for in the realm of contradictory testimony, we have the independent verification of signatures indicating qualified witnesses. The testimony of the people that appeared at the beginning of this source indicating that they were minors, for example, are saying they were unqualified to sign. So that's contradictory. That shows you have, you have a, a testimony in contradiction. Qualified versus others saying they were unqualified. Hakosha, though, is considered the beginning of Hazoma. What do we mean by that? So let's read on in the Gemara to make things a little clearer. Ukeshem at the top of Chofam Aleph. Ukeshem Shein Mazimin Esaid Emel Abifnehem. Just like with regard to the law of Hazoma, Hazoma cannot take place unless the first witnesses are present. In other words, when two other witnesses come and say, "How can you guys have testified? You were with us on that at that time in another place." They're speaking in their presence. So just like Hazoma cannot be uh, accomplished unless the original witnesses are present to, to hear their, uh, their testimony being challenged, so too you cannot contradict testimony unless the ones that you are contradicting, uh, contradicting are present. And in, in this case, the, uh, the, the fellows that signed the document, they're dead. And their, their uh, signatures have been independently verified. To then think that two other witnesses can come and tell us about those guys that they were minors, well, they're not, they're not doing hakosha, contradiction in their presence. Hence, uh, there, it, it's, hence we're not listening to these uh, second witnesses or the ones, the witnesses that are telling us about their, uh, their unqualified status in signing the document. We're simply not paying attention to them. And that's why the source told us that if you can independently verify the signatures, then we disregard those who are questioning the uh, the the quality of the signatures, quality of the signers, and we allow the document to be used as an instrument of collection of debts. Omar le Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman, upon hearing uh, this analysis uh, that uh, Rav Sheshe said, Rav Nachman reacts. Ilu havu kamon. 
Umakrishinahu. If the signers were actually present, and we would challenge them, we would counter them. Have hakasha. They were present, so you've got the original signers, and you've got these saying these two guys saying, "Yeah, but you signed it when you were minors." That would be considered edus bahakasha. That would be contradictory testimony. Velo havu mashkifin behu tahavu lo edus mukheshes, and we would not pay attention to the signatures in the document uh, in order to collect with it. In other words, we would not view the shtar as being a signed document enabling the lender to collect his money. That would be the case if they if it was two against two that were present. Now that the signers are not here. We said they were dead. Now that they're not here. The Inu Havu on. Had they been here, the signers might have actually conceded, yeah, we were unqualified. We were minors when we signed it. Mehemni, are you going to say that the independent verification of this document in the case that, they, that the signers are not there, you are able to collect with it? So to, to summarize or to restate Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman saying, what are, you, what are you saying over here? You, Rav Sheshis, were saying that you're going to be able to use this document to collect, the, the lender can go ahead and collect money from the borrower. But for goodness sakes, if the original signatories were present when these second guys are telling us that they were uh, unfit, you know what? The, the original signers might have admitted, yeah, we were unfit. Or it was two against two, each one in each in each one in each other's presence, we would have thrown it all out. The document would have been worth nothing. Now that they're not here, we're going to consider it a a uh, an honest, uh, solid instrument of collection. Elo Omar Rav Nachman, Uki Tre Lahadi Tre, Uki Mamona Becheskas Murei. Rav Nachman says we're going to pit the two against the two. We've got the two signatures in the document with its independent verification versus the two witnesses that are saying they were unqualified to sign. So the, they, those contradict, they cancel each other out. As far as the money that is represented by this document, uh, the, uh, the, the lender and the borrower, what the money that's in question right now is in the possession of the borrower. The question is, does he have to pay up or not? Do we, do we extract the money from him? So Rav Nachman says that, well, when we have the witnesses cancel each other out, you leave the money as it is, where it is. Leave uki mamona becheskes murei. Leave the money in its current status, namely in the possession of the borrower. And he's not expected to pay up the loan. Rashi adds, uh, what we described so far was a case of a loan document. And if it was a sale document of a field, and uh, there was a, uh, a, a buyer challenging uh, the, the mocher to transfer the property to his possession, we would not do that. We would leave the, the property in its known state, in its known possession, meaning in the possession of the mocher, of the seller. Midi dehave anirse de bar shatya, the Gemara goes on, as Rav Nachman says, similar to the the case involving the properties of Bar Shatya. Now, Bar Shatya is uh, a reference to a person who is uh, is incompetent. He's a he's a an imbecile. The Bar Shatya Zovin Nixi, Bar Shatya sold some land. Osu Beitre Amri Kishu Shaita Zovin. Two witnesses say when he sold it, he was insane. And therefore, the mechira, the sale, is not a sale. The osu beitre, the amri, and two others come and testify. Kishu cholim zovin. When the sale was made, he was of sound mind. He was lucid. He was not insane. So the question: You have these two. You have two contradictory witnesses. Was the sale a valid sale or not? Amar Avashi, uki tre lahadi tre. You pit the two against the two. They cancel each other out. The uki. There's a gears here, Ara, the land, Becheskas Bar Shatya, and you leave the land where it was known to be, meaning in the possession of the 
imbecile. We're not going to change its status. Velo amoron elo de isle chazoka davase. The uh, uh, ruling here that the land remains in the possession of Bar Shatya, in the uh, possession of the imbecile, this is true only if there is uh, a uh, there is proof uh, there's there was a known there was known ownership on the part of his father that the, these properties the properties that are in question were previously owned by Bar Shatya's father, so that this uh, gives Bar Shatya. A, a strong hold on the property. It was known to be something that he inherited from his father. It was known to be his father's avo, less lay chazoka davase, if Bar Shatya doesn't have such proof of ownership. There was no known status regarding the property as being owned by his father. Amrinon, then we would say something else. We would say, Kishu shoite zovan, ukshu shoite zovin. It, when he bought it, he was an imbecile, and when he sold it, he was an imbecile. And, and with that, he wouldn't have enough strength of ownership in order to cancel the sale. Omar Ravivo, Ein Mazimin Esa Edim El Rabbi Avo tells us that Hazoma, which we described before, after two witnesses had said testimony, two others came and said, how could you testify you were with us in such and such a place at that time? That process of Hazoma, of, of uh, repudiating the uh, first witnesses, can take place only if the two sets are present, one with the other. Umakrishen es ho'edim sheloi b'fnehem contradiction of testimony that can be done even if the second testimony is not made in the presence of the first note by way of the markings the double underline and we had uh, noted we have it noted in the, on the side of the, uh, on the upper part of the page the double underline highlights machloikes im oimim de'ein makhishen es ho'edem elo b'fneem uh, we saw Rav Sheshis, uh, who whose name appeared at the bottom of New Testament base, but on the second line from the top, he said, "Ein makfishin esedem elufneim." Here you have Rabbi Avo who says, "Umakfishin esedem shelo b'fneim." The hakoshe can take place shelo b'fneim. So you have a machlokis in uh, regarding the laws of hakoshes edus in their presence or not. Another point that Rabbi Avo makes, the Hazoma Shalobifnam, Nehi Dazoma Lohavi, this idea of of repudiating, repudiating witnesses based on on uh, their inability regarding time and location, their inability to have testified based on time and location, granted that you cannot uh, impose the the status of Adim Zomimim on them unless it's in the it's, unless it was done in their presence now we didn't elaborate because uh, Ksubas here isn't really the forum for discussing at any length the issue of Edus Bazoma but it should be noted that Edim Zomimim uh, are treated in a unique fashion regarding penalty whereas contradictory witnesses we simply throw out both sets of testimony in the case of Edim Zomimim when uh, the first set are repudiated in the Hazoma fashion. We the law says what they tried to impose on the defendant, they must suffer. So that if they were testifying about uh, about uh, so and so owing money, owing a hundred dollars because of the loan that they saw extended to him, when they could never have seen that loan, they will have to pay. The uh, that sum of money to the uh, one they were trying to uh, put into debt. That's called kasher v'asisim lo. The pasuk says v'asisim lo kasher zomam lasos. We do to them what they try to do to the uh, one concerning whom they testify. So as the Gemara says now, granted that hazoma that's 
uh, done not in their presence is not considered hazama, which means we won't penalize the pho- the phony witnesses with the hazama penalty that we just described. Hakosha mia havia. We do have a problem though of edus uh, bakosha, meaning the testimony of these two groups, the two sets of witnesses. Uh, uh, will be thrown out. It would be called Edu's be contradictory testimony.